Thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone. We're very glad to have everyone here today after a very long week for the two teams. I hope the jurors are, have had a bit more sleep than we did last night. Uh, I'm, I'm really hoping it is. So uh, my name is Adrian. I'm one of the systems engineers for uh, Team Voyager. Uh, and I'm very, very happy and excited to introduce the TURTLE mission, which uh, stands for the Undersea Retrieval of Titan Lake Extractions. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, one half of our amazing science team, Sarah. So I just want to thank all the great team members that we had. We decided that maybe only four of us should speak, but everyone played an amazing role in this, so we don't want them to go uncredited. But let's get right into Titan. So Titan, it was the sixth moon ever discovered in our solar system. Granted, the first one was just Earth moon, so you can call that a discovery if you want. The next four were the Jupiter Galilean moons. Then Titan. The first flyby of Titan was in 1979 from Pioneer 11. Then the second flyby was by Voyager 1 in 1980. The last flyby was Voyager 2 in 1981. Those were the first three missions that actually got us better photos of Titan. To follow that up, because we started realizing that just Titan is just so interesting. It the, has an actual stable atmosphere on this moon, but we can't see through it. That is bizarre. What is happening on Titan? And why can't we see the surface? This has boggled our minds, which led to the Cassini Huygens mission, the fourth mission. Then we had Dragonfly being proposed and accepted, which is the fifth. So, what we are proposing is the sixth mission to Titan, which is the turtle mission. And it will bring back sample return missions. And I believe that is fate. Titan was the sixth moon that we discovered in our solar system. And therefore, the sixth mission should be the mission that returns the samples. So what do we now know about Titan? We know that there are plains, there are lakes, craters. With ignoring chemical composition, this is eerily like Earth. There are suspected cryovolcanoes. There's wind. This is a strange environment. It is alien. But when you start adding the chemical composition back in, that's when things start getting out of control. There are so many organics here. They don't have the normal silicate rocks like Earth does. It has hydrocarbon frozen into grains. And like Earth, we have a liquid cycle, commonly called the water cycle, but we can't call it a water cycle on Titan. We call it a hydrocarbon cycle, but it acts just like our water cycle. So these lakes and rivers are full of ethane and methane. So we are going to land in Legia Mar in the northern part where the lakes are. So this is just what we were talking about of that haze that we can't see through unless we break through. So there's a lot about these lakes that we still don't know. So at the current moment, what we do know is that this atmosphere is an organic rich atmosphere and surface. There's things in the atmosphere called tholins and we've done laboratory experiments and we have a semi idea what they are. But if we're being honest, we don't actually know what they are. Are they the building blocks to amino acids? We don't know that. And then you have the outer shell, which is water, ice, and clathrate. Then you have global subsurface ocean. Again, all of this is organics. Then you have the high pressure ice shell. And then finally, you get your silicate core. So the GMR, so it's in this northern hemisphere. This is still pretty far back, but we're going to get closer. This is the lake we are aiming at. This is a special lake because it's full of methane, and pretty much to our knowledge, methane alone. All the other lakes on Titan are full of ethane. So this would be the equivalent of a freshwater lake on Earth. Why though? Why is this lake a methane lake 
while all the other ones are effing. So the Southern Lakes are more effing rich, but the Northern Lakes are more methane. So these are four of the lakes. So Ontario Lacus is up there. The GMR, our lady site's the second one. Kraken Mar is here. And then both Baffin Sinus and Punga Mar is here. So this is just showing you depth profile. So it's just distances on the y-axis, you have elevation. So the GMR is, uh, has a depth about 160 meters, 11% ethane, which as you can see is kind of in line with the rest of the Northern Lakes. So here's another picture of Titan. So it's with the haze and then without the haze. This is just what's driving our scientific question. And this is why we're choosing this target. It's because Titan is just so unique that it does deserve multiple missions. This is not one where you are a one and done mission. You need multiple ones to understand what is happening. So things that we're going to be looking at are organics. So there's going to be ethane, maybe acetylidamine. So there's all of these organics that could be present on Titan and in different forms, ones that we don't see unless we're literally in a laboratory, but yet they're just naturally solid on the, on the surface or in liquid form. It's also worth mentioning that Titan is the only moon in the solar system that has liquid water or liquid at the surface. Nothing else is like it in our whole solar system, which leads us into mission objectives. So objective one is just to characterize the nature and inventory of these organic compounds. So we already have a good idea of what's there, but we want a better one. Plus there's so many organic compounds that we have yet to actually inventory and detect on Titan. So we are going to do that first. Next, we are going to characterize in na the nature and inventory of CHNOPs. So the six astrobiology elements. So carbon, once again, shows up. So it's carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. These are very important. So yes, we know that Titan has organics. We know it also has nitrogen. But what are those actual organic families that are on Titan? Because those families, those functional groups can tell you a lot about the interactions going on. Objective three, is to characterize the chemical, isotopic, and mineralogy composition of the environment. This also puts all of the samples we take back into context, because without that context, you don't actually know what's the importance of that sample, other than we found something cool on Titan, but we need to know exactly where or what the parameters were. Objective four, characterize the sample collection sites. So the actual, very like small place. So that objective three was the regional. So objective four is the exact place we are characterizing the sample locations. So that's pre-collection, during collection and post-collection. Objective five is assess the conformation of the organic compounds, which is another way of saying chirality. So we are looking at the form these organic molecules take. So uh, most amino acids can be shaped in two different ways. It's called left-handedness and right-handedness. On Earth, generally speaking, left-handedness is biologically made amino acids. So if you have a very high number of just one of those configurations, you potentially have biologic, config or biologic activity happening. If you find a ratio of one to one, then it's unlikely of biological activity happening. That's what we need to know. It's, and we don't know that at that current moment. Objective six is identify molecules indicative of hydrocarbon-based life. So these would be biosignatures that no hydrocarbon-based life would produce. So this can be anything from like gases in the atmosphere to organics in the, on the solid and liquid. So objective seven is to characterize presence of prebiotic materials and tholins in the atmosphere. 
So you'll see later that we are not getting a direct measurement of the tholins in the atmosphere, but we can do a lot of indirect measurements to try to deduce what those organic families of the tholins are. And lastly, I'm going to briefly talk about the three main active instrument suites that we have on Titan or on Turtle. So there's Gallimus, which is the gas chromatograph and laser desorption mass spectrometer. The predecessors to this is the GCMS on Huygens and DRAMS on Dragonfly, though we are also using the lessons learned from SAM on Curiosity and MoMA on XMRs when it launches. Then there's BLASTCAM, which is a LIBS at 164 nanometers, a Raman at 532 nanometers, sorry, 532 nanometers, and then another Raman at the deep UV 266 nanometer level. It can also do passive spectroscopy if we just open up the detectors and not fire the laser. This is derived mainly from SuperCam, ChemCam, Invader, which is a mission on Earth that can send lids and Raman underwater because BlastCam will have underwater capabilities, as well as Sherlock, RS, RLS, and then Marsco. The last is Titan Cam Z, which is the multispectral stereographic imager, and that is a direct successor of MassCam Z. All of these have long, successful heritages. Specifically, Gala Mass has literally been to Titan, or its successors have. We know these instruments will work. We are literally standing on the shoulders of giants, and then we're taking their instrument designs and making them better. And now I'm going to turn it over to the mission architect to tell you how we're going to make this mission successful. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jessica. I'm one of the 14 engineers we had out of 16 on our team. And I'm going to walk you through the mission architecture and some of the first components of our subsystems. Uh, so the scientists in our team set us a very lovely wish list of uh, science objectives, but obviously the key question then becomes, how do we actually obtain these samples that they want and answer these scientific questions? And we essentially picked two driving forces for selecting this um, architecture. It was uh, proximity to the lake in terms of a safe landing site and acquiring lake samples. So based on our scientific objectives, our scientists informed us that the most valuable scientific data we could get would be a vertical profile of the lake. Um, in terms of horizontal translation of uh, sample data, that was far less valuable than understanding what the depths of what the MRA looked like. So we initially considered four different architectures. Um, one would be a rover that would land on the land, be able to move close to the lake, take its water sample, acquire solid samples. We also looked at a helicopter, but let's be honest, that is not a very creative approach following uh, Dragonfly. We consider a, and then we considered two aquatic platforms. So the first being a movable um, buoyant platform or a boat. And the second being a buoy with a profiler. Now this is a heritage system that's used a lot um, for deep sea moorings on earth. Um, and this was sort of whittled down from far crazier ideas, but uh, we basically did a big trade study on these four concepts. And based largely on the known profile of the landing sites around Legia Mare, quickly eliminated the rover and helicopter as being land-based landing sites. Concern being that the terrain is too uneven, you risk damage to your landing system. Um, precision landing on Titan is very difficult, which I'll get into in a moment. And also it's a little unknown what the shore is like. Will that rover get stuck in like boggy soil? Will the helicopter actually be able to set down? So that leads us to that two aquatic platforms. Uh, but sort of our whole mission concept was simpler is better. So we moved away from the boat concept, removing a propeller mechanism, and instead focused on a deep sea, or sorry, the design on a deep sea buoy. So go to the next one. That gives us turtle. And we've very nicely indicated the haze that we'll be dealing with um, <laughs> in, in this environment. So Turtle draws very heavily on really good heritage systems here on Earth. So oceanographers have been using deep sea buoys for 20 years. Um, they sit quite deep into the water, are weighted at the bottom, and have an anchor system down to the sea floor on which they run a profile that tracks up and down this, um, this cable. So our profiling system, um, affectionately named for Jeffrey Lander, uh, runs... <laughs> runs a cable or Morgan cable down to the, <laughs> uh, down to the bottom of La Guerra Mare. Um, and at the bottom of this is a weighted instrument 
um, frame or width. So this anchors our buoy in our environment. It's now a static system, which gives us an advantage in terms of pointing comms. We're not gonna drift and screw up our nice vertical profiles. And we can send this profile up and down this uh, Morgan cable to, <laughs> to um, take our liquid samples up and down our, uh, our methane column. Um, there's obviously some pros and cons to this design. So yes, the pro is that it's nice and stationary. Um, we're removing as many mechanisms as possible and trying to keep it on the simpler side of things. Um, it's not likely to be affected by any currents or winds in the system. And um, it doesn't chew up a lot of power by sort of moving around the lake. Uh, it's going to be obviously challenging to launch um, an ascent vehicle from a floating platform, but the anchor gives us a little bit of stability in that area. So just to kind of overview CONOPS. So we launched on either an SLS or a Starship. Um, our Titan orbiter transits from Earth to, to the Saturn system. I'll go into the trajectory in a moment. Once we're in the Titan Saturn system, we deploy our lander, our Jeffrey lander, and um, we have an orbiting portion that maps the environment and characterizes the atmosphere of Titan um, to provide information for our landing system. Once we land on Titan, we obviously have some checkout, check everything's functioning okay before we send down our anchor and then our profile to collect our samples. Coming back, we have a vertical ascent vehicle that comes out of the top of our buoy, which we'll go into in a moment. This docks with our orbiting Titan element and the orbiting Titan element and the ascent vehicle travel back to Earth to safely return our samples to our scientists. Oh, sorry. So obviously our trajectory, uh, our navigators had a bit of a challenge ahead of them. Um, we had uh, big trades on how many orbiters we should have, how many elements. Um, and while there obviously have been trajectories designed to get to Titan and back, our mission has a few key differences. So unlike Cassini, we have to get things back. The other issue is that we're landing in the polar region, which is pretty poorly mapped. Um, and as our other team highlighted, wind speeds can be a real problem. So how do you ensure you're gonna actually hit this lake without um, when you have no idea what the atmosphere looks like. So we incorporate, we have to incorporate some kind of orbiting element to account for that prior to deployment of our buoy. So we initially did a trade study of four different options, each with the purpose solely of supporting our um, Titan-based element and the sample collections. We looked at a single orbiter that would sit in a low Titan orbit and perform all of the support and rendezvous roles. We looked at a single orbit in a single orbiter in a halo orbit around Saturn, um, and that could help with ease of return, but that increases our complexity. We looked at two orbiters that would distribute the rendezvous of the orbiting sample container and the um, communication support and orbit support into two different systems. And we looked at no orbiters, where you have a full system that you land on Titan and take all the way back to Earth. Um, so the end result was. Um, this system that you see here. So we opted for a single orbiter, which would do a interplanetary trajectory characterized by three key flybys, Earth to Venus, Venus to Earth, and then Earth to Saturn. So this does lengthen our mission time. It's um, a launch in 2037 for an arrival at Titan in 2047, but it does um, reduce our mass requirements. We would be using solar electric propulsion based on the NASA Evolutionary Xenon Thruster, or NEXT, um, but it does save us a great deal of fuel. So the transit to Saturn takes 10 years. Once we're in the Saturn system, we perform a Saturn orbit insertion, <coughs> excuse me, um, to put us around Titan. So we target a highly elliptical polar orbit um, with a really low periapsis. And we perform an aerobraking maneuver over 11 months to lower the apoapsis, apoapsis attitude, altitude to get us into a nice circular science orbit around Titan. Now the um, target dates we've chosen place us at Titan in the summer solstice. So we get maximum illumination of the Northern polar region for all our on-orbit instruments. And we have um, our polar orbit puts us in a good communication line with Earth. So once we're in our um, Titan science orbit, our orbiting element spends around two months characterizing the um, polar region of Titan. So we have a near infrared spectrometer on top, oh sorry, near infrared camera, uh, which can peer through this haze layer and get us an idea of where our lake is. 
And we also have a wind profiler um, that can help characterize the wind environment. So we can factor that into our entry point and entry angle in the atmosphere. And both of these will be based on the heritage systems using the Cassini probe. Um, once we have characterized this information, communicated with our ground team, they've given the okay, we would deploy our lander. So uh, descent on Titan is a little easier than Mars, but it's not a trivial problem. So the main two issues are you have a haze layer, which kind of precludes any TRM technology that we currently have. And you have very high speed winds in a dense atmosphere. So our descent system, we basically opted for something very similar to the Cassini mission, which was a non-controlled ballistic entry into the atmosphere. We entered the atmosphere um, at the atmospheric interface at 1200 kilometers. Um, and because we're coming from an orbit, we come in at a nice speed of one and a half kilometers a second. We're using two parachutes um, to control our descent through the atmosphere. And this also gives us the advantage of taking in situ atmospheric measurements during our descent. So the first rope chute um, deploys off the back of our aeroshell. The um, drogue chute then pulls that aeroshell away, exposing our instruments and allowing us to take in situ um, atmospheric measurements. Once we drop below that haze layer, we can deploy it. Sorry, once we drop below the kind of high speed wind region, we deploy our much larger parachute, which brings us in close to the water, drop our aeroshell, and then deposit our lander safely in the water for a splashdown at six meters a second. Um, based on some fantastic studies done by Georgia Tech, um, by Bobby Brown's lab at Georgia Tech. They've actually done a whole lot of models of Titan polar entry and descent. And so based on the sizing and dimensions of our landing system, we could get a pretty good estimate um, using wind models of what our landing ellipse would be. So it's 125 by 175 kilometers, which as you can see, fits nicely in our lake with room to spare. So we're definitely gonna hit our target. So this just gives you an idea of our aeroshell. So one of the really big challenges we had with our system was dimensioning and mass. So there's a pretty standard shape for aeroshells and we had to make sure our entire turtle system would fit nicely in that with some room to spare to ensure no transfer of heating during entry. So our aeroshell is an eight meter aeroshell with a four meter diameter buoy sitting inside of it. Um, this was all sized based on the EDL efficiency ratio, which is a kind of measure of how efficient your system is. And given the similarity between our system and say something like the Mars Exploration Rover, which has um, sort of no sky crane, no retropulsive system, it's just doing a nice multi-parachute descent through the atmosphere and then essentially crashing into the ground. Um, we sized our system based off of that EDL efficiency, which gave us a um, aeroshell mass of around 2.6 tons for a um, landed useful mass of 4.5 tons. So we're looking at landing about uh, seven tons on the surface of Titan. So now that our EDL system has delivered us safely into the methane lake, I'll pass over to our second engineer to walk you through what happens next. Hi everyone, my name is Pollock and I had the great pleasure to be a part of a great team of engineers and um, a great team of scientists. Um, so I'm going to describe it to you our Bobby Boy, also known as the Buoyant <laughs> Observation in Situ Investigation Boy. Um, so floating on the sea um, of liquid methane is a buoyant observation in situ investigation buoy, which is Bobby Boy for short. Um, while designing our buoy, we needed to make sure that it would stay afloat, but be stable and remain thermally isolated from the lake to prevent disturbing the lake's conditions since heat causes nitrogen to release from the methane lake. Um, we sized it to fit around the rocket or our uh, launch ascent vehicle. And, um, that would be placed in the upper part of our buoy and to allow uh, that would allow for a launch from the buoy. Uh, the buoy had to fit inside the aeroshell of the lander while minimizing the uh, mass and maximizing the stability. So I just wanted to speak a bit more about our buoy. So it's a very complicated system and we performed a lot of analysis to make sure that we would be able to stay afloat. Um, so at the top of our buoy, we would have the um, launch vehicle which would then easily be able to launch from the surface. And we would also at the um, relative top part of our buoy keep our um, electronics and our instruments 
which then can run through fiber optics through our cable or Morgan cable. Um, and we would have our width, which is our weighted instrument frame, which would be able to get to the uh, C bed and sort of stay there to provide extra stability to our buoy. And then we would run a profiler up and down the Morgan cable. <laughs> we can't say it enough. Um, yeah, so our profiler would be um, the main sample collection system. And while we're collecting samples, we would be sure to um, take other measurements such as um, temperature, pressure, and turbidity of the water, uh, sorry, of the methane lake. Um, and what's important about this is we allow for a bit of flexibility on the scientist's part. So we will initially bring our profiler from the buoy down to our width and take measurements of the temperature, pressure, and turbidity and allow the scientists to decide where they want to take collect their samples from. That's super important because you don't want to waste samples. Uh, you don't want to take extra redundant samples. Um, after that, we would actually, yeah, we would be able to take a solid sample after docking on our width, and we plan to do that using a coring drill. We will get more in, uh, get into more details about that later. But another important aspect is our buoy will also have a sample collection system. So we would not only collect gas samples from near the top of the lake surface, but we will also collect um, liquid samples from just below the surface. So this allows for us to have certain amount of, um, I guess, just to make sure that if we have any redundant samples or if we're not able to take our profiler back up, we would still be able to take samples that we collected from the buoy and be able to send that back to Earth. So that was super important. Um, let's get a little bit into the details of the profiler. So the profiler, much like in deep sea earth profiling, it travels up and down the cable and characterizes the lake vertically and collects liquid samples from various depths into the lake. We wanted to minimize the amount of um, equipment that we could put inside the profiler that would um, provide extra heat and warm up the um, lake in its surroundings while we're collecting samples. And so we decided to keep only the uh, major like temperature, pressure, and turbidity uh, sensors there, as well as the sample collection system. And we also accounted for um, keeping a certain amount of time just to let the surroundings uh, get back to equilibrium before we collect samples. Um, one of our more important parts of this mission is actually the sample collection tubes. So we paid a lot of attention to this just because um, we talked to cryogenic specialists and a couple of us had some interest in materials and how to keep them uh, thermally isolated. And so what we ended up uh, doing is we have a really nice cross section here drawn by our very special uh, designer. And um, what's special about this collection tube is we don't directly place the sample into the collection tube because that would create maybe a bit of a thermal shock to the samples when they get inside the tube. So we will initially place a coil that will uh, thermally cool down the sample uh, tube collector and we will use liquid uh, methane from the lake to initially cool that down. And um, after letting the environment uh, stabilize again, we would collect the actual uh, liquid methane sample. Um, we would then hermetically seal it. And because of a vacuum jacket, we would be able to keep it at a pretty thermally stable um, temperature. It would be pretty thermally stable. Um, another thing that we added to this collection tube is sapphire lens, which uh, two lenses that are actually that actually have a vacuum in between of them as well. What this allows you to do is actually uh, measure the samples using our lovely suite of instruments that we have aboard the buoy so that we can uh, get certain information and relay it to Earth just in case our samples can't make it back to Earth. And we found that very important because we would be able to have um, all the information that we need from our samples. And still, if everything runs 100% as it should, we would have more samples to characterize back on Earth. Um, these have been modeled from the uh, perseverance sample tubes that uh, Honeybee Robotics had actually um, 
sort of already designed. However, our uh, thermal isolation system and sapphire lens system is just a little different and um, just a touch from our side. Solid sample collection. So this is pretty interesting. We don't really know what the hardness um, of the lake bed is. Now, um, we do know, however, that collecting a soft lake sample would be pretty simple. So if we were to just account for having to collect a hard sample, we would be able to collect a soft sample by the same mechanism. Um, so we decided to use a core coring drill to be able to take a soft sample, take a core of like soft sample and use a vacuum tube to uh, collect the sample and drain out the liquid methane from it. But for example, if we have a really hard surface, you would at least be able to scratch the surface and have certain solid particles released from the lake bed and you would be able to collect those. So we found that pretty interesting. And also our weighted instrument frame would provide extra uh, traction so that we can use torque to, for harder surfaces of the lake bed. We would, um, for liquid sample collection, we also followed the perseverance um, system. We would collect the liquid sample inside the test tube by um, collecting initially, like pumping in the liquid um, methane from the lakes and then storing it inside our uh, liquid sample collection um, storage carousel. And then we would hermetically seal it and then continue to, um, we would, sorry, we would continue to collect more samples. Um, and it, an important point about this is that we would not try to collect every sample before we would return to the buoy. The reason why that's important is if our sample collection method failed, then we wouldn't know until the very end of the sample collection phase and we would end up wasting all that time and have no samples to show for it. So instead, after we collect samples um, in triplicate just to um, get rid of any redundancies, we would go back up to the buoy and we would show the sample to our suite of instruments and we would be able to uh, determine whether we have anything inside those samples or not, which is actually the, at the same time, we would be able to get all the information that we need and relay it to earth. All of these samples would be placed inside a sample collection carousel. Our sample collection carousel is a little different than uh, perseverances. And the reason for that is the outer part of the carousel is where we would be storing the liquid samples that we collect from each depth. And the middle part of the carousel is the samples that we would be collecting from the buoy. So the gas samples and some of the uh, subsurface liquid samples. These would all be thermally isolated from one another to prevent any sort of uh, contamination, like thermal contamination between samples. Um, communications. <laughs> is super important because you don't want to not be able to communicate all the information that you have collected uh, to the orbiter and back to Earth. So uh, this slide shows an animation of how the lander cons interacts with the orbiter passing above. The lander contains a phase array antenna system that can scan the sky to locate the orbiter. So once the orbiter is located and tracking is established, the lander starts sending the payload data to the orbiter. The orbiter passage duration usually varies with each pass, but on average, there's about 30 minutes of visibility in each pass. And the data rate that we have is high enough that all the information collected within a 24 hour period can be trans uh, transmitted within 15 minutes to the orbiter. So this allows ample time to establish tracking and recalibrate the phased arrays in case tracking cannot be established. The design bottleneck, however, is transmitting the data back to the Earth. So even though sufficiently high power is used to send the data back to Earth, data rates of even one kilobyte a bit per second are hard to establish. So due to this reason, we have included an onboard storage on the orbiter. So that would allow for the orbiter to transmit, uh, transmit data back to the Earth when it is outside the window to communicate with the lander. So the system makes use of the deep sea uh, network on Earth to do the telemetry. And the same network is also used to send commands back to the orbiter and lander system. Uh, the principles for communication systems used in this mission design have been tested before in space missions and they invoke high confidence. However, some of these ideas have never been used for deep space communication beyond Mars. How, um, but the fuel savings and the mass reductions that result from such an implementation 
um, make us super excited about this mission. Um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is the Titan Ascent vehicle. This is also very important. I'd just like to put it out there, every part of this mission is super important. <laughs> but uh, this was a particularly uh, difficult um, sort of mission part that we had to figure out. So we know that it's a pretty crucial aspect of uh, the sample return mission. And despite the low gravity on Titan, the atmosphere is four times as thick as Earth, which means that the uh, drag force is also four times the amount. Um, and we really want to carry our precious uh, uh, samples and actually bring them back to Earth, even though we do have um, certain um, operations in place in case we cannot. Um, so we considered several different options to surmount this challenge. We did look into balloon launched rockets as well, and also railgun launched projectiles. <laughs> We've got a very creative team, what can I say? Um, However, we did decide to go with um, this uh, particular rocket. And we performed a lot of trade studies and we realized that a low thrust rocket in terms of feasibility, technological feasibility and reliability would be our best shot at uh, sending our samples safely back to Earth. Um, so this design is optimized for reliability and feasibility. And we also took a look at the Mars Ascent vehicle for overall size, but we, paid a lot of attention at optimizing our fuel oxidizer ratio and additive control surfaces in order to get our, uh, the most reliable Titan Ascent vehicle. So this concept of, this is uh, the concept of operations for our um, Ascent vehicle. So after the sample is loaded onto the Titan Ascent vehicle, we wait for our orbiter to give us the go ahead for favorable launch conditions. Then at mission control on Earth, we also confirm this affirmation of launch conditions. And then on Earth, you get to press the big red button. And uh, that allows for the rocket to launch after a second positive confirmation from the orbiter. So we can rely on this because we know that the weather conditions on Titan are fairly stable and unlikely to change in that small window of time with when we're trying to get our confirmations. Um, the rocket then launches and it proceeds through the stages of um, ascent outlined here. So um, the rendezvous is also very important. So the key idea for the rendezvous with the sample is that once the ascent vehicle has delivered the sample into low Titan orbit, the orbital will act as a chaser and retrieve the sample. So this rendezvous has two phases. It's a course and find phase. During the course orbit acquisition, the orbiter uses an L-band radar for the preliminary orbit determination and a camera for proximity vision-based navigation for precise relative orbit determination. Uh, we propose to feed these um, state estimates into a model predictive control algorithm with closed form optimal control because it guarantees stability for the rendezvous. Um, on the top right of the uh, slide, we ran an example simulation using model predictive control, where uh, the sample container was ejected into an orbit with a 25 kilometer error in um, altitude and a 10 kilometer in cross track error. So the orbiter managed to meet with the sample within two days. So that's pretty cool. Um, trajectory from Titan to Earth. So now that we've gotten all our samples and everything is going great, now we just have to bring it back to Earth. So um, after the completion of the scientific mission, the solar electric uh, propulsion will be used to raise the orbit altitude. Uh, from a high altitude orbit around Titan, we will target a low altitude Saturn flyby to escape the uh, Saturn sphere of influence. And the uh, interplanetary trajectory to reach Earth will target a first Earth flyby to slow down the spacecraft. Uh, then one or two flybys will be um, used targeting Earth and Venus um, in order to insert the payload re-entry trajectory at Earth. Um, at Earth, the orbit altitude will be lowered using the aerobrack maneuver and uh, correction delta V until the correct velocity is reached to release the sample return collector. The, orbital, uh, the orbiter will re-enter into the Earth atmosphere to fulfill space debris mitigation strategies. Um, so as you can see, we figured this all out. So um, <laughs> we're, we're not going to look into anything else. And <laughs> please give us our funding. <laughs> um, I'm kidding. We have an incre uh, incredibly brilliant person coming to conclude this and also uh, talk more about this mission. 
Um, we're gonna look now at our budget estimations. So mass budget first. Uh, if we're looking at the orbiter, we really looked at the uh, Mars uh, Science Laboratory because it's a similar architecture where you have one small spacecraft pushing another big lander towards uh, towards the planet. Uh, knowing our uh, landed mass of about uh, uh, seven tons, we could figure out essentially the dry mass of the orbiter. Um, and then based on studies for the Titan, uh, Titan Saturn uh, mission, uh, which uses an uh, electric propellant uh, for the uh, interplanetary uh, uh, fly and the chemical propell propellant for uh, orbit raising and uh, orbit insertion, we could get the propellant mass for uh, both for an orbiter, uh, total mass of 2.6 tons. Uh, the ideal mass, as uh, stated before, was uh, approximated uh, based on, on previous Mars missions, so about 2.6 tons. Uh, and then the buoy was essentially sized for uh, being for uh, floating uh, to about 4.9 tons, uh, out of which uh, the ascent vehicle is about 650 uh, kilograms. So our overall uh, mass uh, is about 10.1 uh, tons at uh, launch. Uh, as, as stated, based on the Mars Science Laboratory and the uh, uh, Cassini uh, mission. Now, if we look at our overall Delta V budget, uh, we have uh, an Earth to Titan Delta V of 1.6 kilometers per second uh, without the launch, uh, then a Saturn or orbit insertion of 0.75 kilometers a second, a Titan orbit insertion and escape uh, at 0.8. Titan to Earth, uh, 1.6 kilometers, and the ascent vehicle requires 4.1. Uh, so we have a total uh, interplanetary uh, delta V of 4.75 kilometers a second, and as uh, stated, uh, an ascent uh, vehicle delta V of 4.1 kilometers per second. Now, in terms of the overall power budget, um, we uh, ended up uh, looking at the Juno mission, actually, and sizing up uh, a solar array based system for functioning at tight. Uh, and with about uh, 100 meters squared of solar arrays, we can raise 500 watts at the beginning of mission, 400 watts at the end of life, uh, which is plenty for our system, which uh, will uh, require at most 380 watts, most of which goes to communication, about 250 uh, watts. The rest is going to be the instruments on the orbiter, which uh, are measuring the winds and are looking at the uh, ground of Titan, which take about uh, 80 watts in, in total. If we look at the lander, uh, we have a single charge lithium ion battery system, which will give us 200 hours of high power science operation on the ground. Uh, with uh, most of the time spent in idle mode, uh, that's going to give us a fi the 50-day uh, mission that we like with a 40% uh, margin. Uh, the cost estimation uh, was, uh, was quite difficult because this mission doesn't really have uh, any kind of legacy. So looking at the orbiter, that was more straightforward to actually uh, scale uh, based on uh, the US, uh, US CMA non-recurring subsystem CREs. Uh, so that system came up to about $600 million. But the, uh, the rest of the mission, especially the, uh, the, the lander, um, we essentially looked uh, more at the Cassini mission, which weighed about five and a half tons and only went one way and had a small, uh, uh, had a small uh, descent vehicle. Uh, we're going to have to come back. We have twice the launch mass, so we kind of assumed we're going to have at least double the costs. Uh, as also, uh, we're going to get into uh, TRL uh, next, and there's going to be some development costs that uh, go into that. So overall, we landed at a, uh, at a budget of about $7, uh, seven billion. Uh, now, uh, in terms of technology readiness level, uh, uh, the main point is that the orbital and lander instruments all have flight heritage. Uh, in the uh, environment they're going to function, uh, so they have TRL of, uh, of nine. Now, the reason we also have a slightly smaller TRL there is there because the uh, uh, Libs Raymond uh, system hasn't really worked in a very cold uh, um, uh, temperature, but it should not actually be exposed to those uh, temperatures. However, we will want to uh, do some uh, extra uh, testing to make sure that that's not going to fail. Uh, the sample collection system is. Again, based on the MAR sample return, uh, it uh, it will have been um, 
Uh, it, it will have flight heritage by the time we fly our system. Uh, and the two systems which have a low, lower uh, technology resonance level are the ascent vehicle, uh, which uh, mainly is going to work in Mars colder environment in the Mars, Mars sample return, and uh, the lander, which will require uh, more uh, development. Now, in terms of risks, uh, our major mission risk is that the rocket system is uh, would fail. So this is where we're kind of looking at minimum science return, which for us is getting the atmospheric sample on the scent, getting the lander, the, getting the uh, and getting liquid and gas samples from just above the lake surface. If we manage to send this back to Earth, we consider uh, uh, the bare minimum mission to be a success. The next step is to actually get the solid samples where, where we have an unknown. And finally, we want to get the uh, samples back to Earth. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you team Voyager for another fantastic presentation we'll now transition to the 20 minutes of question times by our jury so who would like to start off Something after you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been blown away by both of these incredible presentations. Well, wow, that's such amazing work. I wanted to touch a bit on the science in the loop regarding, if, if I recall, the 50 day missing lifetime on the surface. And my understanding from previous and sixty missions is I know we have 40 percent margin on that, but usually uh, the engineers want some time to do a lot of checkouts before you even start. And considering the one way lifetime coming from Earth to Saturn is about an hour, can you talk through a little bit of your decision making process and what your science margin would be for sample collection? So <laughs> I haven't spoke yet. So the question was we are choosing to do quite a short. Uh, service operation. We're not using RTGs, we're using batteries. That was in the report. I don't know if it was said exactly here. Okay. And the driver of that decision is our power engineer, Connie. Awesome. Yeah. So let me pull up the backup slides if we have. Oh, where's power? Oh, okay. Um, so given that we are very constrained in power, um, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, okay, so we our 50 day mission lifetime actually only includes 200 hours of actual science so that includes everything from profile traversal to sample collection to uh, sample collection uh, verification. And so the rest of that time around 30 days or so is allotted to making that decision in the loop. Um, so before every single um, um, new mechanism is deployed so, for example, like the first time the prof profiler is deployed and retrieved. Um, we want to have scientists check on how that the health of the system and how that is currently functioning. So we already allotted like three to seven days, depending on the, the amount of um, data that is collected between the, the time periods in order to have that in the communication. Um, so obviously we know that um, things will arise and that's part of the reason why we have a really large margin on our power budget. Um, so we chose lithium ion batteries mainly because we wouldn't have to deal with the thermal problem. We could use um, radioactive heater units to kind of disperse heat as needed along with insulation. But um, this 40% state of charge um, allows us to stay in idle mode for even longer. So during our low power idle mode, we're only using our onboard computers and the receiver potentially um, to make sure that we can get the signal when we do, when the scientists do find the, um, finally make their decisions. And so, yeah, so the, because um, this 40% allows us to stay in um, the low power mode for probably an additional month or so for a contingency. In the front. 
Oh, a couple of smaller questions once again. Excellent presentation. Um, two detailed questions. What inspired the use of the phased array versus something like uh, what key where are your top two considerations there? So the laughter is the question was what inspired the choice of the phased array? And the laughter is because we have our own subsystem in the form of a DCAP. So this is our <laughs> communications engineer. Uh, hello. Uh, so as Adam introduced me, I'm Aditya. And uh, thanks for actually asking the question and allowing me to elaborate on this. So, <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I went through a lot of uh, past missions where people have used stationary dish antennas and rotated the whole spacecraft and people have used gimbal based uh, dishes like on Mars reconnaissance and used that to navigate. So at the end, it kind of comes between uh, using rocket propellant or whatever thrusters and between using electrical power and both of them cost more energy than using digital solutions like, for example, uh, having like a uh, phased array IC, which can just use maybe around 12 volts or 20 volts of uh, voltage with some milliamps of currents in order to actually drive our beams. And the main reason why we actually wanted an antenna that can actually um, kind of steer the beam is because I ran some calculations about the speed of the orbiter. And it turns out that even if you use like an X-band antenna, uh, the orbiter passes from the field of view of the lander in two seconds. So if you cannot establish a link, then you have to wait the entire 25 minutes until the orbiter comes back again. So first of all, we use L-band antenna to establish link, which has like a wide beam width. And on top of that, to have a backup, we have a steering mechanism to introduce the redundancy that there is no way we will miss that orbiter and we will be able to establish the link and transfer our data. So that was the idea. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Did you did you have a second part or? Oh, yes. <laughs> the what? Uh, Sorry? That was the go back to your margins. Uh, I think we talked a little bit about your power margin. Uh, what about your the standard mass margins? I may have missed it. <laughs> Can you talk about the methodology there based on your I think I think so the question is about I'm sorry I really haven't figured this out the question is about mass margins and the methodology used and I believe that Adrian is the man for that job uh, okay thank you for the question so um, in terms of the orbiter uh, mass calculations <laughs> that was a more uh, straightforward calculation for the actual uh, dry mass uh, but then uh, for the subsystems within the orbiter, we actually know the communication system uh, mass, we know the uh, propulsion uh, system mass, um, and the power system mass, the solar rays plus the batteries, which have been sized directly. And then indirectly, uh, we look back at a couple of missions, including Cassini, in terms of uh, a relative subsystem uh, mass for the entire thing. So like for the structural subsystem and, and so on. Um, getting the propellant mass uh, was, that's where we were kind of based on this Titan Saturn mission study, uh, which actually was, uh, uh, had a total mass of about six and a half tons, which is not pretty similar to, uh, to what we're, uh, we're looking at. So, that's uh, kind of where our, our, our mass calculations uh, came from. Yeah, thank you. There was a question here. Yeah, sure. I have another power question. I really like the idea of using solar electric propulsion. And I'm wondering if you could walk through the trade you did on SEP versus another system and whether you consider a set stage that you would get in a solar system in a different power solution for operations at Titan Saturn. So the question is specifically on solar electric propulsion, and I believe very specifically on how do we consider jettisoning, jettisoning the solar electric propulsion stage once we reach Saturn. Is that correct? Juliana, take it away. Um, hi, hello, thank you for the question. So, um, at the beginning, the study for the trajectory propulsion was uh, actually based on chemicals, uh, chemical propulsion. But um, 
given the uh, huge size of our buoy and the fact that we didn't to that we have to go back um the the trade the trade off was to have a slightly um lighter satellite that uses um solar electric propulsion to uh, actually power the 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 propulsion and the entire system and um this study has, has been proved to be feasible thanks to juno um experiments uh, around um jupiter that proved that um Solar uh, that solar arrays um, can be can work on sat on um, on um, around uh, Saturn and um, a huge um, area can guarantee the amount of power that we need. Actually, we won't jettison any um, solar arrays because we will use them to go to go back and to um, also do some operation at, at Titan. Um, so. This is mainly um, based also on another feasibility study done by Dr. Strange um, um, for a mission uh, carrying two payloads at Titan, uh, Mongol Fear and a, boot, and a boat. So um, this was also on their side the most feasible way to uh, reach Titan with a huge pale mass. And um, yeah, so the, the trade-off has been chosen also because during our um, design mission design study, um, we evaluated also the, the chance to have different orbiter um, instead of one or not orbiter at all. And then the decision, the decision came to just have one orbiter uh, that fulfills all the requirements for power and also propulsion. So uh, the solar electric propulsion, even if um, not yet, not yet uh, used to reach Southern, can be an efficient way to reach it. And um, yeah. And are you assuming that you're using set at Southern? When you're leaving as well, or is it, or do you use CP and only set kicks in once you cross the threshold? So uh, the solar propulsion will be used until reach, um, we reach Saturn. All the insertion operation will uh, use chemical propulsion because they are like the the heaviest one in terms of fuel. Um, the only moment where we will use HEP again is to rise the orbit of Titan. And from them, we will use again chemical propulsion and until we reach um, a distance close enough to the sun to use again solar energy propulsion. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, we had a question. Oh, we have multiple questions over here. Sure. Um, yeah, again, like everyone said, this is, this is fantastic. And I, I have to tell you that I don't think your report does justice to what you did. It's <laughs> <laughs> not because you were writing it at like I particularly love the, the sample collection system just because that's something that I tend to work on um, as well. But I also work with instruments. And so I, I need some clarification based on what I read in here and what was presented on. It sounded like there were three instruments, but maybe there's more on, on the lander. Are they on the buoy? Are they in the width? Because it sounded like there are some there too. And so I'm just trying to get a handle on what the payload actually is, where they are, and where the measurements are being made. Okay, uh, so the question was uh, for clarity, which instruments are specifically on the lander, on the buoy, on Bobby, uh, and which are on the profiler? Yes. And can oh. I also add which, if any, are on the descent for the atmosphere? Right, yes, yeah. I sort of got that, but then there's some pieces that are not. But yeah, so for clarity, where are the instruments? Right? All right, right. we're going to go with our Australian on the team with Jess. <laughs> <laughs> this might be answered by two people because we all were kind of in subsystems. Um, in terms of the distribution between the buoy and the, uh, sorry, the buoy and the profiler. So we were concerned about the profiler being down away from like our nice thermally insulated buoy about how, how we would keep things warm. So we tried to move as many instruments off that uh, profile and up into the buoy where we could really do nice thermal um, design. So on the actual profiler, we only have um, basically a CT, a meth uh, sorry, a Titan version of a CTD. So a temperature sensor, like a thermocouple. Um, we have a pressure sensor that's like the um, piezoelectric quartz crystal system and probably an optical turbidity sensor. So our profiler has uh, the two cables that actually winch it down and up and running down that is our um, fiber optic. <laughs> we have a fiber optic umbilical that comes through that. So our um, mass spec and our uh, Libs Raman are up in our, um, sorry, our Libs Raman is up in our buoy. We can shoot laser down the fiber optic cable and we have our lens suites that may have not been clear in the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> operating on lack of sleep so we have a, a lens suite sitting on the profiler but essentially it's not actually doing the sensing the, the detecting it's the detecting is happening up in the buoy 
Um, and then the other sort of main portion of our profile is the sample collection system. Um, but the samples are all analyzed back up in the buoy, again, where we have much more stability, we have a nice thermal environment. Um, and then we also run a fiber optic cable to the bottom of our WIF, which is our weighted instrument frame. Um, again, a lens suite down there to look at our sort of turbid low soil environment. Um, and I might hand over to Anna just to talk about the actual instruments on ascent, sorry, descent and um, on, the boy. on the boy, like what's actually on. Oh, sure. Um, so I uh, mostly worked with the GCMS um, that is on the buoy. And the idea there was to have the descent kind of mimic Huygens, where we are taking um, only two samples, unfortunately, because the Tholen haze uh, did not work out very well for visibility. We couldn't deploy the parachute until after it. So uh, missing the Tholen haze, but I can still, it looks, get two um, samples. And so then once we actually land, hopefully safely, on the uh, lake, then that GCMS is still in contact with the liquid underneath. And then also towards the side where it can be uh, in contact directly with, or in, uh, sorry, um, in contact with the atmosphere directly above it. And so that's with like a T intersection there. Um, and then, but yeah, just to clarify, so we yeah, lift yeah, our, yeah. Um, our back shell off, so kind of similar to the Huygens probe, we lift the back shell off before we actually drop the aeroshell, so it's the opposite of Mars, um, <laughs> so that our mass spec can be, can be exposed yeah. to the atmosphere. Um, and it's connected somehow to the liquid? I mean, I, I, the laser desorption part was a little, I got that there's a hole yeah. when it's sniffing the atmosphere, but... Yeah, um, unfortunately, that is still under construction. Okay. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, Phase A, we're in yeah. phase A. But, uh, <laughs> you know, luckily, um, Morgan was able to help me out a lot with this and give me some good ideas with how we can best utilize that instrument um, because the primary goal was to collect information from the atmosphere, but it's such a cool instrument, especially what's going on Dragonfly, that I wanted to use that to the best of its abilities. Sure. Okay. Thank you. But among the three of you, that totally that cleared up for me anyway. That's what I was looking for. So I appreciate it. And I didn't need to help too much. You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> there was a question in the second row. So I uh, have both of these groups wanted to try to collect the solid samples on the farm of the, the lake bed, but specifically assuming a hard surface or like a back for that. Uh, what? What you want to address that particular challenge of a hard surface versus So we all discussed that, but I will nevertheless. So the question was, how did we decide that we would have the drill ready for a hard surface rather than the possibility and scientifically likely possibility that it's quite silty? And for that, I will turn it over to no, oh, that was an eyebrow raise to Sarah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so while we assume that it's going to be soft, it could be harder. We also don't know exactly if the organics down there would have lithified or have different synthesis processes that we are unaware of. Uh, the most likelihood, though, is that we could just go down, scoop it up, be fine. But on that back chance that we can't and we really need these samples, then it's better to be prepared. Yep, in the front, and then and we got two minutes, so. Yeah. Okay, I just want to clarify the sample canister. I understand the tubes, great description of the tubes. How is the sample canister transferred from the, the like profile that's collecting it? Apparently, I think there are other tubes on the on the buoy, and they're getting to the top of this five meter rocket. How is that transfer happening? And then both there and on the way home, how are you continuing to control the thermal environment? So the question is on thermal canister transfer and thermal canister thermal environment control. And for at least the transfer, I'll turn it over to Corey. Yes, yeah, so uh, this is something that we took into a lot of consideration. Um, we know that it is very thermally sensitive. Um, so we basically tried to thermally isolate as much as possible. Um, we have our tubes, which are um, vacuum, vacuum sealed. We have that extra wall of protection. They are thermally isolated from each other. Um, and so the, the idea is that we have this elevator shaft that is also thermally isolated. 
we are trying to control that, that temperature as much as possible. Um, there, we're using aerogels as part of that installation. Um, and we are then using, uh, we have all of our instrumentation isolated as well, so that um, we have the uh, sapphire lenses in the bottom. So we're able to read it with as little context as possible to the instrumentation. And then, oh, go ahead. Yes. yes. Um, just something that I want to say real quick about this. Um, Sarah and I proposed what we thought was an outrageous amount of sample, which was 500 grams. And they actually allowed it. <laughs> um, and then even said that we might be able to get more. <laughs> um, and I really appreciate that the engineering team allowed the scientists to get so much actually. Like really the only thing that we gave up was that golden haze, everything else we got to keep. Um, so I think that maybe there was some sacrifice to money, but I mean, there was also so much creativity going on. I think that we got, we all got, yeah, excited. <laughs> awesome. Um, I just wanted to add one more thing to the thermal isolation. We were planning on using like multi-layered thermal isolation um, with uh, vacuums wherever we could. And we would also place the sample um, canister inside another thermally isolated box, which would then go into the launch ascent vehicle. So we just like kept adding layers to minimize the, um, I guess, thermal transfer. And um, yes, and how do we transport it up to our launch vehicle? We're planning on using a bit of like a conveyor belt style, um, like movement to the launch ascent vehicle, but we will look a bit more into how we're going to do that. So that's the 20 minutes of jury questions done. We'd now like to open up for five minutes to the general public. First hand at the back. Hi. Uh, I heard you correctly. You said an unscrambling system solar panel. Is that correct? That was correct, yeah. I'm just curious, solar panel. Uh, did you consider at all how that could be stowed in a conveyor you know, belt with the bearings and be as impossible as that would be? So the question was how is a 100 square meter solar panel uh, stored in a launch vehicle fairing? So I can take that one. That was simply baseline from the uh, JUICE mission, which is flying to Jupiter. So JUICE actually does have 100 square meters and we're launching on a much bigger rocket. So we're on minimum SLS just from uh, weight characteristics. Uh, actually at the back was first and then this one. Yeah. So you mentioned you hermetically seal the sample when you take it in. So then how do you do a mass spectrometer process? Do you have to uncork the seal? So the question is on mass spectrometry with a sealed sample and Anna looks excited. <laughs> um, yes, so uh, as you could see, Sarah and I both jumped to this. <laughs> um, this was uh, a dual effort with us. Um, so the mass spec is actually a destructive process and it would not be in contact with the sample. It would just be monitoring the, um, the environment around it uh, before and after we took the sample, preferably. Um, and then also we had an advantage that we could possibly take these mass specs once a day so we could kind of um, line out or put a timeline on uh, anything that is fluctuating like temperature or nitrogen dissolution, exolution, and pressure around it. And then I'll let you do the comments. Uh, yeah, so uh, the GCMS also, if possible, we can get an inlet that pulls up from the lake. That would be one way, but generally speaking, the GCMS is just characterizing the environment because it is so destructive. Um, at the very bottom, if we're talking solid samples, that is being characterized by the blast cam, which is a deep UV Raman spectrometer at 266 nanometers, and then the green Raman spectrometer at the 532 nanometers, and then ellipse at a 164 nanometer. So Raman spectroscopy tells you molecular structures. It can also do like isotopes and chirality. So that's what we're going to mainly focus on the solids. Um, because it does have underwater capabilities, we can shoot the bottom of the lake and get that same data with liquids. Um, and then the LIBS is also a destructive process. And that comes last, but that is pure chemical composition. So at no point are we actually like, the samples we take are not going to the G 
CMS because that's just going to get rid of them completely. Um, but the way we characterize them is both environment right before collection. Um, the sediment is easy because you just shoot the laser and pick it up. Um, but for the liquids and air, once we have them sealed, we have these sapphire optical lenses. And once they're taken back to the buoy, we are actually using another fiber optic cable from Blastcam for passive spectroscopy. So what we're gonna do is just put a visible light on our samples and see like how they react to our visible light and the light will pass through the spectrometers and they'll read out. So we will have to have a baseline of like, what does the samples empty look like with spectroscopy? But that's how we're going to look at the liquid and gas samples that we do take. Okay, question at the front. Yeah, my question was about the, um, the sample collection. During the, in the last couple of slides, uh, one of the slides said that the, the sample collection system was CRL9 because it had a fair take on Mars sample return. And I, I'm a little confused by that because this is operating in a, a much different and much stricter temperature regime. Uh, you're collecting liquid samples and you, you have a drawing of a sample pool that was significantly different in design. So could you explain that? So the question is on the TRL of the sample collection system and the argument of heritage from MSL. And I will turn that over to Adrian. Uh, yeah, so fundamentally, it's a very, very similar system. Uh, You're correct that there will have to be some developments based on the Mars uh, sample return mission. Uh, and that's kind of similar, if you will, to what will happen with the rocket. But the, the, the point here is that fundamentally, it would, it would function uh, in a very, very, very similar way. That's kind of what we were going for there. And we don't think that actually the sample collection system uh, itself would be the, let's say the main point of, of failure for actually getting the, the sample. So that already concludes the round of our public questions. But before we move on, we'd first like to put our hands together for both teams today. You did absolutely fantastic job. You really think it's amazing just how much these 16 students and each team can, can accomplish from Sunday night until now. We really gave them a difficult mission brief and I think every single one of the 32 students would agree with us with that. <laughs> but I think you've blown everyone away with what you presented with today. So before everyone leaves, we have a moment to allow our jury to please stand up and then we can head back upstairs for the deliberations. Thank you very much. Um, we'd also we'd also really like to thank the organizing committee. They did amazing. They kept us well fed and well fed. <laughs>